We have to do this yeah, campaign. Was, uh, just, I, I happen to find it on Derek, but I'm Derek, taking video Derek. tonight, right here, actually. Okay, that, yeah. that was fantastic. And so we listened to some of it, some yeah. of the testimonies and things. <laughs> and it touched, uh, <laughs> touched our heart. And what's really funny, when you called, uh, everybody that you mentioned are very, very close friends with Donna and myself. Yes. Because we were with Victory Outreach uh, just after... Uh, David Wilkerson had gone to New York and, and witnessed to the Mau Mau's and, and uh, uh, Nikki was his really his first, well you know all this, but anyway, uh, we know Nikki very, very well uh, and David and then Sonny Argonzoni was Nikki's first disciple and he had some trouble and then he'd take off and Nikki would go out and look for him all night long. And uh, he had quite a habit to kick, as you know. So, but Sonny Argonzoni started Victory Outreach, who Don and I worked with for 16 years. Mm, fantastic. But uh, we, uh, all the time, we, Nikki would always be our guest speaker at uh, uh, world conferences. We started at uh, their church in La Puente with maybe 2,500 people. We outgrew that, went to Long Beach Convention Center outgrew that, ended up wow, at Los wow. Angeles Convention Center where we had over, I mean, close, literally close to 100,000 people um, from all over the world. We weren't into building mega churches. We'd raise up men through men's homes. Then we'd send them out and uh, go into, ask the, the police, what's the worst part of town? <laughs> and that's where we'd start our men's home. And we'd start by witnessing on the streets and then build that out of the men's home, we'd build a church. And then we'd raise up people to where they became just on fire for God and leaders. And instead of keeping them there and just building this mega church, we'd send them out. And, right. uh, and they go out into the world. And so we're in 27 countries now. Oh, my. We're being invited into Muslim countries. Oh. We cannot speak the words Jesus, but they're mainly be they're dealing with their drug problems. The governments are just uh, with the crime and the drug problems. So once we get them in, then we can disciple them in Jesus. Amen. But we can't go out discipling on the street, you know, mentioning Jesus. So, but we're in the Philippines, we're all, well, every, about every country, 27 countries. It's marvelous. And it's just growing and it's just exciting to be a part of. And, uh, then I, I heard about this place here. Uh -huh. The pastor that uh, I was at with uh, the Tacoma Church, we came out of Seattle okay. and started Tacoma uh, Vic Victory Outreach Church. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and the pastor that I'd worked with, uh, Isaiah Washington, for many, many years, uh, his health got bad, he retired. And Pastor Thomas Hudson, who runs, this is his vision, here, with, uh, which is where our heart is for these men, uh, these future pastors, these, yes. are, these are future evangelists, sure. uh, just yeah. mighty men of God, That's right. mighty men of valor, and they're getting a hold of Jesus Christ, their lives are changing, and it's just a miracle to be a part of and see, and, and uh, so just... Uh, just Watching God, seeing out of God's way, watching Him work, yeah. and uh, loving on Him, encouraging, and uh, yeah. it's just exciting to see. And so, uh, the floor is yours. We'd like to open with prayer. Yes. That's the only way to open. Well, why don't you do that? I sure would love to. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord. That's the only way we can come to you, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for this time tonight, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives, Father. We thank you for reaching down into the pit and pulling us out, Father God. Lord, the treasures out of darkness that you talk about in Isaiah, uh, Father, that... Uh, touching, giving us a heart of flesh where we used to have a heart of stone. Yes, Lord. Father God, giving us a hope in the future, Father God. Lord, I pray tonight that every eye, every ear would be listening in the supernatural, hearing in the supernatural, Father God, not in the natural. 
that you would do a work, Father God, a mighty work by the power of your Holy Spirit in each and every person here, each and every mind, Father God. Lord, that you would touch them. We bind the enemy that would come to help uh, just to cause all kinds of chaos and all kind of lose focus, Father God. We want to focus on you and you alone, Father. That you, that you have a word for us tonight. That you come to change us, Father. Lord, from glory to glory, we thank Linda for being here tonight, Father. Bless her. Anoint her, Father God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's present in this place. Oh, just flood this place with your Holy Spirit, Father. Lord, to you be all the glory. Uh, no flesh is going to glory in your presence, Father. But it's all you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we all say. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank Hallelujah. you, Lord. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Oh, well, you made it. Come on. Yeah, I had Thank to get, you, Jerome. Thank Concrete off me right quick. <laughs> hey, Jerome. Hi. 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 Over, guys. Uh, oh, you want to sit here? Come down on there. Come on in. Oh, we got room over there? Or, or is there? Yeah. Yep, there's... Crunch up. There's another chair over there by you, Steve, or is there? Yeah. Do we need another chair? I can grab another chair. I got both chairs. Okay. We're good to go. We're good to go. Okay. <laughs> well, this is a great honor. It's a historical occasion, actually, Amen. Uh, Amen. that we should meet, and that we should know the same people, Amen. and uh, we have grown to just love you guys that come down to the Jesus People Coffee House in Tacoma. Amen. We've had such great times in the Holy Ghost, Amen. and uh, yeah, so they thought it would be a great idea if I'd come out and meet you, Pastor, and meet your wife. Uh, and meet the rest of the guys. So, Amen. this is this is great. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm an Iowa farm girl. I drove tractors, milked cows, and rode horses. Whoa. Never been to a big city. Wow. Graduate from high school, but just before I did that, my mom got really sick, and she was going to die. And doctors and money couldn't heal her. And I didn't believe in God very much. I, I, I didn't see how that God could be relevant. Because in the church that I went to, they always talked about a Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago. But they never talked about a Jesus that could do anything right now. Well. So as a teenager, that didn't turn me on. But as my mother was dying, doctors couldn't heal her, I walked out to a cornfield one day and I looked up at the sky and I said, I don't know how to talk to you, I don't know really if you're there, but if you are, heal my mom and bring her back home. If you do that, I'll know you're real and I'll serve you. Guess what? <laughs> Two days, my mom was home. Completely Hallelujah. healed by the power of God. God. I knew then he was real. That's the kind of God I was interested in. A God that could hear you now and answer prayer now. And I went yeah. back out to the cornfield and I said, thank you. Here I am. Amen. Use me. <laughs> well, it wasn't long after that that um, I went to Bible school down in Springfield, Missouri. Hallelujah. And... Uh, I was down there, and um, ha, they were strange folk. Uh, what I mean by that was I was raised in the Methodist Church, and they were from the Assembly of God uh, denomination. And uh, they were down there talking about, well, you not only can get Jesus in your heart and have real salvation, but you can get baptized in the Holy Ghost yeah. and fire. Wow. What? Yeah. And when you get baptized in this Holy Ghost and fire, God will just take over your, your tongue and your mouth and you will begin to speak in a language you've never learned. Amen. And you'll speak in this language and it will just bypass your head 
and it will go right to heavenlies. And you'll be talking direct, connect to God. Yes. From your heart, the Spirit of God and Jesus that's in you, right to God, and you will really feel the Holy Ghost and fire, and you will be never the same again. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, to believe that or not to believe that, right? But uh, I watched a few people around me, and the ones that had this Holy Ghost and fire and could speak in this heavenly language, they were just so excited about Jesus and so excited about helping people, and they were just happy all the time. And uh, so I put one and one together and got two, and I said, that's for me, even though I'm, I've never been taught about that. That's what I want. I'm down at the altar and I'm seeking God and I'm trying to get these tongues. Trying to get this language. So I'm pounding the altar. I'm crying out to God. I'm praising God. I'm really working hard at it. And one night, I was just remembering how wonderful Jesus was that he died on the cross and shed his blood to cleanse us from all of our sin. I started thanking him for what he did on the cross and praising him. And all of a sudden I noticed that my mouth was not speaking English. I was just speaking in another language. And my soul was filled with joy and the great presence of God. I had just been baptized in the Holy Ghost in fire. Hallelujah. Hey. I'm 19. So the guy at the charge of the Bible school there, he said, now we're going to have a very special speaker in the assembly. It will be a great challenge to you. And I thought, okay, good. And, uh, so I went to the assembly with everybody. We're gathered together. And uh, this great speaker, he said, we were going to have. And... Uh, a little skinny guy, smaller than any of you, walks up on the platform. And I think, how can anything great come out of a skinny guy like that? <laughs> All right. So then he gets up. <clears throat> He's introduced as David Wilkerson. I'm meeting him at 19. Hallelujah. <laughs> David Wilkerson. Whoo! He might have been little, but I'm telling you, when he be opened his mouth and began to speak, had you ever heard him personally? Yes. Opened his mouth and began to speak, you knew that there was a man that walked with God yes. himself. Amen. Amen. He was filled with fire yes. and zeal and vision, and he told an awesome story. He said, I had a little country church in Pennsylvania with a lovely, beautiful building and a lovely parsonage for my wife. And my congregation was growing and I'd never been to a big city. And uh, everything was fine, but I made the decision that I'd stop watching television two nights and at the end of the night. And instead, in those two hours of, of television, which I needed as a pastor to relax, I would take those two hours and I would set them aside just to seek God. <laughs> well, he set them aside to seek God and one night when he's in there, there's a Life magazine on his desk. And he's in there to pray. And he goes over and he just flips open the Life magazine and right there is a picture of seven teenagers from Brooklyn, New York. The entitled Michael Farmer Murder Trial. The kids were skinny. They were ugly. And the paper said, they're murderers. But he thought, oh my goodness, what am I doing? I'm in here to pray. Why am I looking at this magazine? I'm getting off focus. Well, he prayed and prayed and prayed a little bit, but before he could know what to do, he opened the magazine again, and as he looked at the seven boys who had just stabbed to death Michael Farmer, who was an invalid in Central Park in New York, they had each taken their turn of putting their knife into his body and left him in a pool of blood. They were up for this murder, and as David Wilkerson watched them, tears started to flow down his eyes. 
He'd never met him before in his life. He's crying. And he's wondering, what in the world is wrong with me? Well, this feeling to love those boys didn't go away. So one day he just gave up and said, okay, put gas in the car. I'm going to drive to New York. I'll tell these seven murderers about Jesus. And I can come back home to my lovely church and take it easy. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. He drives to New York. He gets there. And it's a freaky place, man, if you've never been there. I, I lived there some years. I'm telling you, 12 million, more than that, probably 15 million now, cars everywhere, screaming, gangsters, prostitutes, junk, junk. I mean, wow, it's hell. And uh, David ends up in this hell, and he doesn't know how to drive down the right streets, he doesn't know what to do, and uh, he never met anybody on that first trip, and he just comes back really discouraged. And But you know what? The Holy Ghost never went away. So he had to go back, and he heard that the seven murderers would be up in a murder trial. And he thought, that's for me. So he went to the murder trial, and he took his Bible, and he was sure that he was going to preach to those seven, and then he could be free of this burden. So the murder trial happens, and the seven murderers, they come in, and he sees them. And the judge is there, and the people are there, and the newspaper reporters are there, because now it's nationwide news. And he doesn't know what happens, but all of a sudden, as soon as they've been there, they're ready to take them out again. And as they move to take out the seven boys, David Morkelson jumps up with his Bible in the air, shouts at the judge, and says, Your Honor, I'm a preacher of the gospel. Please, I got a message. I got to talk to those guys. <laughs> the judge ordered the policeman to grab them and take him out, disrupting order. He's yeah. thrown out of the courtroom. Hmm. He's standing outside of the courtroom, a bit shook up, and there the newspaper reporters are. Click, 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 click. He goes to bed that night and gets up the next morning going to drive back home to his little country house. As he gets up the next morning, he notices that he is on the front page of all the newspapers <laughs> as a fanatic waving his Bible in the murder trial, which is the big number one story. Oh, my. Oh. It's sudden death, death. He's so embarrassed. He's a respectable minister, you know. And his parents are respectable ministers, you know. And there he is, right in the front page. And he's walking down the street in New York looking for his car. And he's dying a thousand deaths. Then he hears somebody yell at him, Hey, Davy. He looks around, well, nobody knows me in New York. Hey, Davy! He looks around. There's a gangster, a gang leader, saying, Hey, aren't you the guy that we saw in the newspaper this morning? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, says Angel. <laughs> I see that the police don't like you. Police don't like us either. That makes us friends. Slip me some skin. <laughs> An angel said, You want to meet some gangsters, do you? You want to meet the murderers, do you? He said, I know everybody. I know every gang, and I know their turf. Now, a turf is from what block to what block to what block to what block is your territory. And they make wars or rumbles, gang wars, over their territory. And uh, Angel said, I know them all. I know where they hide, I know where they party, down in the uh, tenement, basement of the tenement houses. He said, I'll, I know all the leaders, I'll, in, I'll introduce you to the leaders. Come on, I'm your guide. Oh boy. And that's exactly what happened. That's the start of this story, of Teen Challenge, which became the story of Victory Outreach, the great story of the Book of Acts happening in our now time. Amen. Because Angel knew everybody. Amen. He took them down. He met the leader of the dragons. He met the leader of the chaplains. He met the leader of the hellburners. He met the leader gang after gang. 
One day, he meets a skinny kid that's filled with anger. His name is Nicky. At that point in time, when Nick, when David Wilkerson met Nicky, Nicky had already stabbed 16 guys. He was full of hatred. He came up to David Wilkerson and said, I hate you. I don't want you here in our turf taking anything away from us. He said, I could take a, a knife right out of my boot and I can stab you to a thousand pieces and leave you right in the street. And he could have. Davy just looked at him and said those famous words. You could do that, Nicky, but every one of those thousand pieces would cry out, God loves you. God loves you. The first great message preached on the streets of gangsters. Nicky just scoffed and walked away. But we know that it was only about three, four weeks after that that Dave was up preaching and Nicky was there listening together with all the Mau Mau, Mau Mau gang. And David gave that call, that call that comes from the heart of God. Why don't you turn to Jesus now? Jesus can forgive all your sins and the bad things that you've done. Jesus can give you a brand new start. He died on the cross and shed his blood to pay the price. This night you can become a new man and get a new beginning. Come and I'll pray for you. Hallelujah. And Nicky got up. The one that threatened to kill him just a few days before and walked to the front and stood in front of David Wilkerson and knelt and began to weep like a baby and accepted that love that only Jesus can give and broke out that hatred from that kid's heart and filled it with the love of Jesus. I love the next part of the story because after Na Nicky had been touched by God, he walked back to where the Mau Mau's were all sitting and he said, You followed me in gang warfare. Every time I've com commanded you to fight, you fought. Now, I'm commanding you to get up and come down and kneel like I did, repent of your sins, and get Jesus in your heart. Mm -hmm. And yeah. every one of the Mau Mau stood up and went down and got saved. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Great story. Yeah. Well, back at the Bible school, meantime, <laughs> Nikki Cruz is telling the story to us students. And I'm listening to this story, man. Wow! <laughs> and he just kept telling story after story after story, which, I mean, like, hot story, like, hot story, like, hot story, like, <laughs> come on, man, I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle. My eyes are getting bigger and bigger. I know how to drive tractors and milk cows and ride horses, but wow! Never heard anything like that before. <laughs> then when the man got to the end of his talk, he said, well, he said, I can't do this thing anymore by myself. It's too many turning to God, too much work. I gotta have help. He said, that's why I came to this Bible school. And he said, if there's any of you students that's sitting here today, if you would like to come help me in the streets of New York, I'm going to get a great big house to put these people in to get a new start in. He said, you meet me in the library. My heart, I'm telling you, man, was going, ka -boom, ka -boom, ka -boom. I thought it was going to jump right out of my body. I could hardly wait to get into that library, Pastor Joe. I got into the library and there was a few others and I thought, Whoo! I was scared to death. What am I going to say? What are my qualifications? I know how to milk a cow. <laughs> I know how to drive a tractor. <laughs> uh, yeah. What am I going to say? Well, I got the Holy Ghost. I can talk in another language. <laughs> anyway, I went up and said, Hello. I'm Linda Meisner. I'm 19. 
I think God talked to me today while you were talking. I'd like to come help you. He asked me if I was a really born again believer. Yeah. He said, did you know you might get killed? And I said, well, that's all right. <laughs> uh, you filled with the Spirit? Yeah, I got it. Uh, good. Well, uh, yuck. I need somebody, so you must be the one God's choosing. Come right as soon as you finish school. Ha! Huh! Pastor, the day I had to call my parents and tell them, Hello, Mom and Dad, I don't think I'm coming home right after school this year. <laughs> oh, why, well, you got another idea? Well, yes, I mean, I'm just only going to go to the streets of Brooklyn, New York to work with the organized gangs and drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear, that sounds a little bit dangerous. I know, but God is with me and I'll make it. Yes. Well, that's how I got in the story. So I went to Brooklyn, New York, and we got this great big three-story house. And we had to clean it, and God provided the beds. How many of you have read the book that I'm in, The Cross and the Switchblade? Have you read it? I read the condensed version. Yeah? Well, I'll have to get some of those books out here for you guys to read. Uh, the Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkerson, and I am the Linda in the book. And help make this story... And this Cross and Switchblade book has been translated into languages all across the world. Yeah. And it's, there is also a film of it. So maybe one night you guys can uh, get to see a film of it. But um, anyway, so I'm one of the very first workers then, Pastor Joe, that worked together with David Wilkerson in the streets of yeah. New York. Yeah. That's right. And there I met Nicky Cruz, mm -hmm. just a brand new convert. He was already saved by the time I got there, but he was just really, you know. He <laughs> stuttered at the beginning. He could hardly talk. And he couldn't. And God touched his mouth, and he could just speak clear English. Complete miracle. Anyway, and uh, so I started working there, knew Nicky. And then, of course, I met Sonny Argonzoni. Amen. And Sonny Argonzoni, at the time I met him in this first house with David Wilkerson, Sonny was on a mainline drug addict of heroin, $75 a day, which in 1960 was a big habit. Yeah. And he had been to the uh, federal institution to try to get clean, but he couldn't get clean. He tried everything that man had to offer to get him clean. They couldn't get him clean. But I was there when we just put him up in a room on the third floor of that first team challenge, put some Christian music and uh, Bible reading in the room, and said, you're going to be here for three days, cold turkey. And then all of us were in there really praying for him, really praying for him, really praying for him. He's really screaming in the beginning. Ah! Yeah, yeah, I remember the whole thing. It was terrible hell. But he came through clean on the third day. And Jesus healed him totally. And Sonny Argonzoni, as you heard Pastor say, became a mighty man of God that raised up victory outreach that's all over the world. And by the way, uh, Nicky Cruz also. Uh, I, I just came back from Europe. I was 40 years in Europe. And I saw that uh, Nicky Cruz was in Africa and different European no, countries. No. I mean, those boys covered the globe. Just those two became such mighty ministers of God from nothing. nothing. So you don't know, gentlemen, what plan God has for your life. Amen. And you don't know what God can do with you and where God can take you and how many souls you can pull out of the fires of hell Amen. and how many you can help get into the kingdom of heaven if you'll just be diligent to seek the Lord with all of your heart and get baptized with that fire and speak in that language and yeah. listen to those Bible studies and follow God the whole way. He can make any of you a mighty man and a mighty warrior of God. Hallelujah. And he can yeah. forgive all your past. Amen. Take out all the things in your heart and in your head that's not right. 
and He can place in you a new heart, yes. a new mind. It says in the Word of God, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become good. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Now, so many miracles were happening at Teen Challenge that David soon began to get calls from Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, all over the United States. Hello, David. We also have organized gangs. We also have drug addicts. Please come to our city. Please help us. So David began to travel a lot at that point then, Joy, before he'd been on the streets all the time. But then David began to travel. And, yeah, I mean, it began happening to me. I began to travel. And sometimes I sang with David Wilkerson in his uh, convent, uh, conferences that he would have. And uh, I began to travel. And you say, Linda, how did you get, how did, I milk cows and I drive tractors and I ride horses. I know, but I had something to say. <laughs> I had something to say. I had a story to tell. Amen. So, I started getting invited too all over the United States to tell the story of the miracles that God was doing now and to other countries of the world. Yeah. That's how Teen Challenges were born in city after city after city. And that's how I learned how to be a preacher. Amen. So that was fantastic how he made me a preacher. <laughs> and I'm preaching to hundreds all over the United States and everything as if I'm kind of famous. Because I'm in the book, and I was there, and I saw the thing happening, and I knew the man. <laughs> I knew Nikki, and I knew Sonny, and I knew David, but best of all, gentlemen, I Jesus. knew Jesus. Amen. I knew Jesus. Okay, now, I want to tell you something else. During this time period, America went to war against Vietnam. Mm -hmm. From that, there rose up a peace movement. Follow me now, we're going somewhere. Mm. There rose up a peace movement. And from that, there rose up a man by the name of Timothy Leary, oh, yeah. who created the LSD in San Francisco. That's mine. Yeah. From that, a spirit of heavy rebellion began to hit the youth of the American nation. Yes, <clears throat> and the hippie movement was born. Mm. Drop out. Tune in. Yeah. And before long, gentlemen, there were actually hundreds and thousands of long-haired hippies all up and down the coast of the United States. Freaked out on drugs and free sex, sex, nobody could do anything about them. Just laying out on the beach, hey, it's cool, ain't it, brother? Yeah. When that happened, it so happened that I'm traveling all over the United States. So, Pastor Roy Johnson of the Philadelphia Church in Ballard, I don't know if you know him, of a big church in Ballard, invites me to come and speak in his church. So I come up from California into Seattle to speak in this church in Seattle, yes. I speak in the church, and then I said, Who wants to seek God and get God and serve God all the way? Just come down to this altar and cry out to God, and God will meet your need. The altar was packed, Pastor John. Kids were crying like babies. So Pastor Johnson said to me, Linda, we, know, we haven't been seeing this. He said, please don't go away. He said, can you cancel your appointments? He said, would you stay here a few more nights in Seattle in our church and speak? 
I'd never done anything like that before because I only have one subject and that's what God's doing by a miracle. But I said yes by faith. And I tell you what, the Philadelphia church at that time of history was packed. And kids came from churches all over Seattle. The place is packed and they're getting God in their heart. They're crying out to God like a baby. Yes. After that, church after church began to invite me all around Seattle. I was preaching in Seattle and I come into that church, Episcopal St. Luke's Episcopal, Episcopal Church in where is it? <coughs> Ballard. Church. Is it also in Ballard? Or somewhere in It Seattle. doesn't matter. Anyway, they were Episcopalian. They didn't believe in this Holy Ghost language, but the Holy Ghost language began to come to them. They began getting saved, and, and I met them, and the whole thing, to make a long story short, revival broke out in the churches of Seattle. And I didn't go away. I was right in the middle of it. Then I started a Teen Challenge Center in Seattle. I thought, that's good. But one day, I had a vision. A vision's when you can see something plain. But you're not asleep. I saw Jesus right over the city of Seattle. And I could hear the voice of angels singing. There he stands with healing in his wings. A hope for all who know the way of care. A hope for all who know the way of care. Right then, God was talking to me that it was not just the drug addicts and the gangsters and the alcoholics. I, were, I was to go and tell all the youth of Seattle about Jesus Christ. Mm. And from that day, I began to work everywhere telling the youth about Jesus Christ. I got a little clubhouse. I invited out a letter for helpers. Helpers came in to help me the first summer. Sixty kids showed up and said, we're ready to go evangelize. We went winning souls everywhere. Well, I went to Mexico City to preach because I was still going on preaching assignments. Something big is about to happen. I hang right on here. In Mexico City, I'm in the floor. The Holy Ghost shows me another vision. In this vision, I can see a whole army of young people, hundreds of them, with Bibles in their hands, standing up, proud to know Jesus, and going forth and preaching the gospel. And I also saw in the vision a coffee house. And God showed me just exactly how this coffee house was to look. Tables, chairs, a platform, Christian music, free coffee and donuts. Yes. So I come back from Mexico City with a new assignment. And I'm looking for a coffee house. And I find a little place down in First and Yesler. Some souls begin to get saved. One day a fancy looking lady comes by with lovely clothes. And she says, what you doing here, lady? Yeah. Oh, I said, we're preaching the gospel to the drunks and to the drugs, uh, addicts, and uh, to anybody that's going by the street. We're just loving the people in the street and they're getting saved every time we're open and, and they're giving their life to God and it's really great. And she said, who's are all these? Oh, they used to be alcoholics and drug addicts, but now they're helping me and we're doing a great job here to reach the others. Oh, she said, this is far too great a work for you to be in a place like this. A great work like this really needs to be in a bigger and a better place. I thought, well, anybody can talk, lady, <laughs> but we're doing what we can with the few dollars we got. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the lady comes back again, and uh, she says to me, Hi, Linda. Hi, I, I remember me. Yeah, yeah, I remember you. She said, Have you got time to get in the car with me? I want to take you for a little drive. Yeah, yeah. So she drives me over to the Seattle Center where the Space Needle is. Mm. She said, Look there. I look at Fifth and John. And there's a great big warehouse. She says to me, How do you think that warehouse would do for a Christian coffee house? And she pulls in her pocket, comes out with some keys, and gives them to me. You can have it, she said, for $10 a month. Wow. <laughs> We're awesome. right across from the Space Needle. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Well, we walk in this place, and it's a dump, just between you and me. It's full of... Junk. 
and it's dirty, and it's dusty, and it's broken down. But I had a few disciples around me. I mean, you know, if I had you guys with me, we could have done it. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Anyway, we started throwing out all the junk. And somebody had a dad who had a truck, and he loads it up and carries it away and throwing it all down. Then we start washing down the walls and cleaning the windows and cleaning the place up. And one guy said, this place needs paint. Yeah. And he said, I've got an idea. And he goes down the street and there's a paint shop. And he walks into the owner of that paint shop and he said, hey, we are, uh, yeah, we're, we call ourselves new believers. We're believers. And uh, we're making this such and such coffee house. And it's for all the youth and drug addicts and alcoholics. And uh, we need paint and we haven't got any money. <laughs> the guy just smiled and said, uh-huh, so. And he gave us the paint. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. We painted it all and it was really beautiful. And then uh, 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 somebody else said, well, we got to have a stage if we're going to have some music on it. And uh, uh, we didn't know how to build it, but there was one of the guys that had a dad. And yeah, yeah, they had a company. So they came and the guys built us a stage. And another one of the guys said, hey, you know what? We need to have carpet on this stage. And one said, well, there's a carpet shop down the street. <laughs> and sure enough, he did it. He walked right into the carpet shop, introduced himself, and says, this is who we are. This is what we are going to do. And uh, <clears throat> we need carpet for our prayer room and for the stage. And he gave us the carpet. Praise the name of the Lord. Yeah, yes. awesome. We had to have tables and chairs, and we had no money. And uh, then somebody said, well, what about these spools? That wire, uh, what do you call them, you know, uh, yeah. uh, these spools that wire wrap around. If we had some of those spools, we could clean them up, bring them in, and we could paint them different colors, you know, psychedelic man, and it would look really, really cool. So sure enough, the guy with the truck, we go pick up the spools, we paint, paint them red and green and yellow, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the guys tell me now that these spools had a hole right in the middle of them. You know, when it came time to get a donation, you know how we did the donation? <laughs> if you want to give a donation, just put it in the hole. <laughs> and then the guys tell me at the end of the coffee house, after we were going and everything, they dump, they turn over the spool and get the, get the money, you know, that dropped out through the floor. That was hilarious. All right. Anyway, <laughs> God provided the chairs. God provided everything. Yeah, the coffee yeah. pot. The coffee, the place gave us free donuts from the donut shop. Yeah, and there we were. And we made ourselves a little flyer. We decided a start date. And we passed these stairs all around the Seattle center, all around downtown to, uh, Seattle, all around in the shopping center, all up and down the street. Come to our coffee house. Free coffee and donuts. Come to our coffee house. Come to our coffee house. And guess what? They came. <laughs> And now we had them, and we gave them coffee and donuts, and we had music. Some of the first music we had was from um, St. Luke's, Glorious Liberty. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of And Andre Crouch and his disciples. They were quite famous, but they played in our coffee house. We called it the catacombs, and yeah. So we had our prayer room, and I preached every time. Then I gave, said, now close your eyes, and I gave an altar call. How many in this place want to get right with God right now? Hands will go up all over this coffee house, yeah? Fine. Everybody to raise your hand, follow me. And I'd get up and they'd follow me and we'd go right into the prayer room. And in the prayer room we had benches like this, like, like you know, and you got down on your knees around these benches and you cried out to, for God and they got salvation. Hallelujah. They asked Jesus in their heart, man. Yeah. And the yeah. first time there was ten, now let me tell you all, the first time there was ten, then there was twenty, and then they went on to twenty-five, and then there was thirty. Then they went from thirty to forty, to fifty, to sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, and a hundred. What happened? They kept bringing their friends. The saved ones kept bringing their friends. Come see this coffee house. They kept bringing their friends, bringing their friends. The prayer room was full, and they'd cry. And then after they cry and repent, then they would love Jesus. And as they were loving Jesus, they broke out in their heavenly language. And Jesus Hallelujah. baptized them with the Holy Ghost and fire at the Hallelujah. same time. And we had to baptize.
baptize them in water too. And we didn't have any water to baptize them in water, so we baptized them in Puget Sound. And we baptized them in Green Lake. And soon the news got out. And the newspapers started to follow us. Everywhere we went, the cameras were on us. And the news spread. God's moving in the catacomb coffee house. And then they began to testify. And they'd end up there and say, hey man, I was really on this junk. I was really in the dope. I was a dope pusher. And there was no hope for me. But Jesus changed my life. Hallelujah. Then the next one would say, I was, just an al I was just an alcoholic. I couldn't live without the bottle. And I was all the way down. And Jesus changed me. Hallelujah. And they would get up and you couldn't shut them up. Amen. They just Amen. kept testifying. I just kept preaching. Yeah. And the kids just kept coming. By the end of three years, there was 1,000 to 2,000 kids at the Catacomb Coffee House every weekend. And that spelled revival. We did all kind of things to make a Jesus Revolution revival. Hallelujah. And I tell you, we made folk festivals with our own musicians. We attended other folk festivals. There was one in Woodensville. 25,000 kids strung out on marijuana in Woodensville, laying out in the sun and out in the dirt. Free sex, drunk, doped. I thought, my goodness, we can never make our way through there, Pastor, with 25,000 kids. Mm. But by that time, we had watched that the communists had underground newspapers. And so we had said, aha, ha. So we made an underground newspaper called Agape Love. And we printed all the testimonies from all these guys and girls, plus what was in the Word of God, with pictures. And we sold the agape and spread the agape in the schools and downtown Seattle and everywhere because we had a free voluntary arm, army to get this job done. So when we come to this folk festival, you know what we did? You can't guess it. We rented an airplane. <laughs> and we flew over the top of this 25,000 kids and we dropped the agape newspaper right down on top of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. We made such a big march with great big signs and a big truck carrying a big cross and the police giving us an escort and we were from uh, the side of the street to the side of the street. We were so broad we were covering the whole thing. Brothers and sisters, brothers, we filled the town of Seattle with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Then one of the guys who'd been an old alcoholic from uh, Hate Ashbury, he'd gotten saved. So he was a fanatic for Jesus now. He had water to drink <laughs> that no man knew of. <laughs> he said, Linda, we got to spread this Seattle revival all over the state of Washington. We've got to spread it in the Northwest. Well, in the meantime, we found out that this revival in Seattle was not only happening in Seattle, it was happening in San Francisco. It was happening in San Diego. It was happening in Los Angeles. In other words, God put his Holy Spirit upon me so that it can happen in Seattle and can happen in the Northwest. But God, put his hand upon other men in the other cities and they were doing the same thing and the spirit they were hippies were getting saved by the hundreds and the national news media got a hold of it and renamed us and called us the Jesus people, people. movement you remember this yeah. some of you <clears throat> the Jesus people movement we were hundreds we were thousands yeah. Let me tell you just what happened in one city. And this is all for a reason that I'm telling you this story. We took 150 full-time Jesus People Army soldiers. Who was that? That's just dedicated disciples. We took them to Spokane, Washington. We had permission to be in High Bridge Park. A pastor had given us a little place where we could work out of, like a store, empty storefront. High Bridge Park. We didn't have any platform. 
So, I said, put these park benches, these park uh, tables, put them together. And then I climbed up on top of it. Mm. And then I said, hello, everybody. Be here tomorrow. Something's going to happen that will cause you never to be the same again. And, of course, they started drinking wine early in the morning, and they weren't planning on going anywhere anyway, because that's where they hang out all the day. <laughs> but we came the next day. We had some music. I climbed up on the picnic tables. There it is. And started to preach. And it's the same beautiful message. Sonny knows it. Nikki knows it. Pastor knows it. David knows it. Some of you know it. About Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Oh, yes. Jesus shed his blood there. It cost him a lot. But that blood is powerful enough to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. And if we will just believe in him, and if we will just accept him, he'll give us a brand new start, a brand new clean life. And we can live for him and be sons and daughters of God. Oh, and then yeah. I said, as I said that, I said to the kids in the park, bow your head and close your eyes. And they did and I said, now, how many of you in this high bridge park in Spokane want to decide to follow Jesus right now? Would you lift your hand? Two thirds of the kids lifted their hand. Oh, man. I couldn't believe it. Well, actually, first it was one half of them did. So I repeated it. And the next time, two thirds of them did. I couldn't believe it. I said, okay, two-thirds of you going to turn to God? All right, come on up here. They came up and knelt in front of the picnic table. And you could hear weeping all over the place. They were weeping, weeping, mm -hmm. weeping. It, uh, the weeping uh, tears followed us in the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that. And anyway, then after that, somebody said to me, Linda, did you know that there's a river that's running through this very park? Ha, 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 ha. What do you do with the hat? river? Then I told him about getting baptized in water as a symbol of that old man being dead and the new man raising up. Yes. And so we baptized in that river that day. 200 kids from Spokane. Hallelujah. The next day we baptized 200 more. Thank you, Jesus. Well, our little... Um, storefront was like our storefront was like here on this street but right around the corner there was this cafe this uh, place where all the dopers went that's where you went to get your dope and they had an underground newspaper that told them about Ouija boards and witches and told them what to do with their dope and all of that and they had a, a rock band called Wilson McKinley. And, um, yeah, they were the headquarters for the devil, right around the corner. Well, after we had done all that baptizing, then it started. They started coming from the devil's place around to the Jesus people place. Two would come around, they'd get saved. Three would come around, they'd get saved. Four would come around, they'd get saved. One would come around, he'd get saved. Five would come around, they'd get saved. 